evening, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate. My name is Gina Perrill, and I'm the Institute's Chief Strategy Officer. We're really honored to host the city's first forum on the future, and particularly excited because it's taking place during Civic Engagement Week in the city of Boston. Senator Kennedy strongly believed that successful democracy depend on, depends on participation. He was a constant advocate for empowering people to take an active role in their community, and he envisioned this institute as a place where that notion would be fostered. Earlier this month, the Institute released our latest national civic engagement poll, and I wanted to share just a couple of the results with you. It's a poll that measures Americans' level of civil, civic engagement, their knowledge of government, uh, and their knowledge specifically about the United States Senate. The results so show that we have some work to do, but there's also some really hopeful numbers as well. Although only 20% of Americans could name both of their United States senators, and just half knew that their state had two senators, we did find that a majority of Americans just this year have taken personal action to engage with the government. That's a very inspiring number and a real testament to civic action. Even more impressive, 90% of Americans agree that educating young people about our government leads to better democracy. And 91% agree that ordinary citizens need to become more active to safeguard our democracy. So you're all here tonight because you know the value of active civic participation and how that helps make our democracy work. So I, I do tip my cap to you on behalf of the Institute. But that commitment to civic engagement is really why we're so proud to, house, to host this forum. So thank you for being here this evening, and thank you to the City of Boston and to Imagine Boston 2030 for bringing important discussions like this to the Institute. Please do come back and visit us. Come take in the full experience of our exhibits and programs. You are always, always welcome here. So now it's my honor to introduce the next speaker. Joyce Linehan serves as the Chief of Policy for Boston Mayor Martin J. Walsh. She is a cherished Dorchester resident and a genuine asset to the city. Please welcome Joyce Linehan. Cherished asset, I feel like I'm at my wake or something. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Um, on behalf of Mayor Walsh, I'd like to uh, welcome you here to uh, the first forums on the future that we're holding um, as part of the Imagine Boston 2030 engagement process. Um, really, really pleased to be here at the Edward M. Kennedy Institute in my hometown of Dorchester, Massachusetts. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one at this moment in time who misses Senator Kennedy dreadfully, um, so I really do. Um, Imagine Boston 2030 is a comprehensive plan. It's the the city's first citywide plan since 1965, so 50 years, which is much too long a time uh, not to have a comprehensive plan. It covers all aspects of how local government can best serve a changing city, um, including creating housing for a growing population and making it affordable, preparing for extreme weather patterns, growing job opportunities into the neighborhoods, supporting our waterfront and park system, identifying the transportation needs of 21st century Boston, and ensuring equity. And the plan has been informed by more than 14,000 Boston residents, hundreds of policy experts, hundreds of community organizations, uh, hundreds of city hall staff, and a dedicated staff of two who have pulled this all together um, in the last year. So I'd like to recognize um, uh, Rebecca Emanuel, who's the director of Imagine Boston 2030, and Natalia Ertebe, who is the manager of uh, community engagement, who put this event together. So why are we doing these conversations? Um, as we get ready to release a final draft plan for public comment, which will happen sometime in the next couple of weeks, we wanted to engage the public one more time and think about some of the sectors that most impact the development of the city. So this uh, panel is going to be talking about the future and the past, the future and the history of planning um, 
thinking about how we might learn from our mistakes and how we might make the future better. And then we've got two upcoming panels, one on the role of philanthropy in the future of the city, which has become uh, quite a force over the past couple of decades, and that's May 3rd at Faneuil Hall. And then um, we've got how academic institutions play a role in Boston's future, May 9th at the Boston Public Library at Copley Square. So we hope that you'll consider joining us for those. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening, um, Renee Loth. Um, Renee has long covered politics and public policy as a Boston Globe columnist, and she was the newspaper's top editor of the editorial page for nine years. She's been active, an active thought leader in American politics, media, and public policy at the local and national levels. Currently, she is the editor of Architecture Boston Magazine, and I think there are copies of that around here tonight, um, the quarterly ideas publication of the Boston Society of Architects, who are a valued partner of the city. She also covers politics and architecture for WBUR's Cognoscenti, and occasionally contributes to the Globe's op-ed page. So please welcome Renee Loth. How's that? That's good, huh? Well, hi, welcome. <laughs> As you just heard, my name is Renee Loth. I'm uh, a uh, occasional columnist for the Boston Globe and editor of Architecture Boston Magazine. Um, while our esteemed panel is, is uh, filing in, I just wanted to say hello and welcome and thank you for having us here tonight. It is such a beautiful um, space to be having this kind of conversation, the perfect um, really site for a uh, sort of civic dialogue that we hope to happen tonight. Um, I've, uh, I've lived in Boston for 47 years, which makes me a newcomer on this stage um, and kind of a carpetbagger, but I hope you'll uh, bear with me. Um, my role here is to introduce uh, our panelists and then to facilitate a conversation for about 45 minutes, um, after which time we'll be hearing from you. We really want to have this be a conversation, and um, I'll be uh, trying to uh, facilitate questions from the floor. I think there will be uh, people with uh, roving mics for you at that time. Um, so why don't I just start um, with Fred. <laughs> Fred Salvucci, he is a... Uh, you know, of course, everybody on this panel is well known to everybody in the audience, so I'm going to make this very brief. Um, Fred is a civil engineer and professor at MIT who was uh, the state secretary of transportation for three terms. Uh, he was an advisor also to former mayor uh, Kevin White, uh, which is where I first met him when he was uh, the director of the East Boston Little City Hall. Uh, next, we have Chris Grimley. He is a partner in the design firm Over Under, a co-author of uh, a new book called Heroic, which is about uh, modernism in mostly public buildings, and he's also a, a frequent contributor to Architecture Boston magazine. Um, Madhu Duda Kohler is an architect and planner uh, who teaches at Boston University and is an advisor to BU's new-ish uh, initiative on cities. Um, next we have Ted. Ted Landsmark is the new director of the Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Planning at Northeastern University, a fairly new position for him. And he's also former president of the Boston Architectural College and an architect. Tony Lee is an urban planner who served as chief planner for the BRA and head of the School of Planning and Design at MIT. And he was on the original team, and I guess Fred was as well, on the original team that devised the last comprehensive plan we had for the city of Boston back in 1965. And then, of course, Mel. Mel King, needs no introduction in this audience, is an activist and educator. Um, who is also a former state representative from Boston and a finalist for mayor in 1983. I just wanted to welcome everybody here. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. Everybody can hear okay? Good? 
Uh, there are a lot of people up here, <laughs> and there is a, a great amount of history and wisdom and experience represented on this panel. So I want to urge everybody to try to keep your responses brief and really listen to each other um, so we can make this more of a, of a conversation um, instead of a, you know, serial, uh, <laughs> serial remarks. Um, you know, when I think about uh, the task of taking on uh, a comprehensive plan for the city of Boston for the first time in 50 years, that really required a certain level of bravery, uh, I think, from the Walsh administration because, um, you know, the city is still uh, suffering in a lot of ways a kind of hangover from the battle days of urban renewal in the 1950s, which... Uh, uh, you know, destroyed whole neighborhoods. And those scars are really still um, being felt by many people who live here. And the memories are still uh, very fresh for, for people. Um, and so, you know, the battle days of top-down bureaucratic city planning, um, you know, were correctly, I think, swept out of Boston. And, and people uh, really were worried and kind of squeamish or queasy about uh, comprehensive master plans um, as a result. But, you know, the, the process that replaced that top-down bureaucratic uh, kind of process had its own problems, its own flaws. Um, for many years, people felt that the development uh, system in Boston was kind of ad hoc and one-off and opaque and nobody really understood the rules and or maybe there weren't any rules. Um, and so I wanted to uh, I think I'm going to start with Ted. Yeah, I'm going to start with Ted right in the middle. Um, I just wanted to ask you and anybody else, you've all been here a long time in the city, um, but we're starting with Ted. How does this plan, I mean, Joyce mentioned uh, learning about the mistakes, learning from our mistakes of the past. How does this plan sort of thread the needle between those two models, two very different models of city planning, and how can we learn from our mistakes of the past? Um, for starters, when Mayor Walsh was elected, um, he and uh, Joyce and I think uh, a number of um, uh, other uh, senior advisors um, knew from the outset, uh, in part because of the electoral process, which um, they had come through after a mayor who had been in place for 20 years, um, that the city was a very different place than it had been 20 years before. The demographics were different. Uh, the financial model of the city was different. Uh, the nature of transportation was different. Uh, the um, power sources within the city um, had either evolved or were in the process of um, uh, being transformed. Um, and uh, they knew that uh, because of the uh, very substantial differences uh, that existed within the city, a new plan uh, was needed. Um, and um, uh, Mayor Walsh appointed me to the board of the then Boston Redevelopment Authority, now the uh, Planning and Development Agency. And early on in that process, I was approached by um, some global marketing firms who um, raised the question of whether we fully understood um, how Boston was now perceived in a global economy, that we weren't the same uh, in terms of our perception as we had been 25 years before. Um, and that uh, that created opportunities for the city to rethink and rebrand itself uh, in a way that was more consistent with both the uh, perception that we had in a global economy, but also in relation to the fact that we were just a very different city. Um, and it was clear that the old top-down model driven by a handful of planners at uh, one or two uh, very distinguished universities in town, um, or the, the bottom-up model that seemed to uh, be driven by um, uh, just a lot of community planning and meetings that often ended up in a kind of inertia and stasis, um, needed to be looked at differently. Um, and, and so the 2030 process came into being as a way of um, threading that needle, of recognizing that there um, had been some major problems and flaws 
um, in prior ways of, of planning and looking at the city, um, that there were new tools that were available that could more inclusively engage people in thinking about how the culture of the city had changed, and it wasn't just a matter of you know, changing street grids or responding to all of the new land that had come into being um, on the waterfront, um, and that a, a new way of thinking about how cities envision and plan themselves into the future was necessary, uh, and this process uh, was the result of that. You know, it's so interesting to hear you talk about um, the, the sort of perceived need to rebrand the city, and certainly we are not the city that we were even five years ago, and yet I wanted to ask Tani about this because um, in preparing one of the issues of the magazine that you have um, outside, um, we took a look at that original 1965 plan, and we, in fact, reproduced some of the beautiful um, illustrations and charts and, that were in that plan from 1965. And one of the things that struck me was about some of the similarities, in fact, between 1965 and today. In fact, the, the sort of branding for the city of Boston at that point, back in 1965, was Boston City of Ideas. And, you know, this is what we think of ourselves as today as well. And so I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about, yes, some of the changes um, in the city over that long period of time and also maybe some of the similarities. Uh, <coughs> uh, Boston in 1965 was a very different place. And as it was even more different in 1950. I think in 1950, we reached the peak of operation at 800,000. We uh, mostly the World War II shortages and the long depression. And the, the city began to fail at that point. And I think what happened was that the Prime Minister and the top down thought the solution was high race and there were no song lyrics, in fact. And the, um, the thing with high race was interesting because it was to bring people back, middle class back to the city. Um, somebody had to remind them that this high was on both ways. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, white flight was already happening in the city. And I think that the, um, um, uh, by, so by 1960s, uh, Boston was still in the funk. Um, I think it's very interesting that I just went to a, a um, presentation on Detroit. Detroit reached its peak in 1965. And their population has dropped now down to 800,000 from close to 2 million, I think. And where Boston's population has sort of grown back. And I think it's um, just to sort of comment on the plan. The plan is a value of a massive plan plan comes out of architecture. And that's the problem. Uh, because architecture, we have a building to build. It's finite. Finances are already figured out who's going to use it. Cities are way on the other side. Now, in between plans for campuses, for instance, or plans for defined areas. And even they recognize that the context is different, that you can't have a massive plan that projects very far because you have to reevaluate from time to time. And it's like the, uh, the economy changes, the world changes. Um, the fact that Boston now has 25% of its population foreign born is a reflection of the 1965 Immigration Act. And I think those are very important things that are very difficult to control, as they pointed out. So the 1965 plan, that's one of the things I say about what happened in 1965 plan was 1965. And if you think of what happened in the late 60s, everything changed in America. The social art people, and in Boston, it changed very dramatically. Uh, there was a wonderful school plan in the 1965 plan. All that went out the window with busing. And I think the continuation of the white flight was as even more extreme to them. Between 1970 and 1980, the population fell into the rule, 90% of which were white. So, but what happened, I think, interestingly enough, with plans is that 
it's not just the plan creates something out of it. The plan created, in fact, a, a cover, um, a more complicated reaction. It turned out that it activated the city. I don't want to, um, we can talk about the city and stuff, but the way the communities reacted to the climate and to the urban renewal, to the highways, created the Boston today. So out of the, the activists emerged to use up after those the hybrid clients were stopped and the urban renewal was, was reduced. What was left was the water public line. And so the whole CDC movement in Boston, which is substantial, <coughs> that's a huge part in creating the city of today. So Middle Victoria and South End, Royal Rock Street, RC, along the Southwest Florida. And I think it also created the anti highway movement. Interesting enough, it involved people who worked on the plan, some of them sitting right here, who then led the anti highway movement. And the anti highway movement led to change the big part of the city pipeline was the highway plan. So the highway plan was substantially changed at that point. And so the whole southwest corridor, the whole transit system, the, the, the big gate, all came out of that reaction to the plans. And that is really important because we're not just subject to, you know, the whatever plans on our city. In fact, it's one part of this kind of intricate, interwoven reaction from and we created in Boston a very substantial um, um, citizen activist. <laughs> so CDCs have created housing in Boston and in Boston um, that is very essential to the stability mm -hmm. of the neighborhoods. Tom, did you want to say something you were eager to jump in on that? I can with my turn, but you know, I, I just wanted to sort of bring um, also sort of focus the discussion on the planning process itself of Imagine Boston 2030. And, and I think, you know, uh, certainly a master plan like that, you know, is an opportunity to frame sort of the future of the city in so many ways as this plan has been doing. But I also think that, um, you know, there has been, and like the other panelists pointed out earlier, there has been a sort of a marrying of the kind of planning processes. So, but, but I think, you know, um, we have to stop thinking about sort of a planning process as being top down and bottom up, because I think in a way we are getting um, caught up in the old um, sort of arguments and tensions within the planning field. And um, I, I think the question now should be that if this is, this is this extraordinary endeavor to engage the people of the city, then how do we really assess and learn if we are really incorporating the voice of the people? And, you know, I say this both as uh, somebody who's really a champion for this plan as well as somebody who has a healthy skepticism. And I think that is my role, you know, as, as a citizen, as well as an academic who, who practices in this field. So, um, really, I, I am waiting to see when the, you know, parts of the plan actually start to take, you know, take shape, what the reaction of the city is going to be. Because as much as we can predict, sort of, and, and try for the optimal outcome, <laughs> the pro if the process is right or not, and, and if it really lives in the spirit of which it is being sort of, the citizen engagement, we'll only know when we can assess that. And, and I think I am skeptical about sort of, as much as I appreciate the outreach, I still want to know that we have lessons to learn and make this even better. And, and stop really discussing, oh, top down versus bottom up, because I think that's not really where the argument should lie. You know, I, I want to turn to Mel for a second, because we heard a second ago about how Boston is growing, the population is growing, and we're, we're coming back from years of uh, Boston being kind of a backwater in the 60s, and 
Chani brought us back to the 60s. Um, but I'm, you know, I think about growth in the city of Boston as both a blessing and a curse, right? You know, it's great that the city is growing. We have low unemployment rates in most of the city. And yet, the growth is also creating a lot of pressure on neighborhoods. And I guess I'm wondering what you think about that. You know, how do we manage, how can planning or the city plans help manage the growth of the city so that people are not displaced and so that the city is not um, just for the wealthy, which is a concern I know of yours and of mine. How can a plan help us there? Is this on? Yeah. Um, I don't like to have to begin this with this statement, but the sound system is not working in the way that I can understand a lot of what's been said. So I don't know what's happening out there, but um, and it may be just me. Um, so the question you asked is, the city is growing. The city's what? Growing. Growth? Growing. Okay. Downside. The what? Downside. What is the downside of that? Um, I don't know. <laughs> well, um, I guess my question really is, how can the city manage growth so that everybody shares in the uh, uh, you know, success of the city of Boston? Well, it seems to me that the uh, first question is, in whose interest are we operating? And until we are clear about that, um, this conversation and others like it are a charade. Okay? And so... Um, I start that because in terms of, you know, being in the uh, state government and others, the thing that I want to know is in whose interest. Now, let me just back up. I'm a student at Claflin College in Orangeburg, South Carolina. I get a letter with a clipping of the uh, Herald newspaper which describes my neighborhood as a slum, Skid Row. I open it and say, well, we called it home. Okay. Um, so how does it get to be that? And then as I begin to understand about urban renewal, that the criteria had to do with um, devaluing the particular parts of the city that needed to be renewed. Okay? And I looked at that, living in the New York streets, uh, 35 different racial, ethnic, cultural groups attend the Quincy School where my brother sat next to the man I'm sitting next to right here. Uh, we have a wonderful photo of it. And um, so um, try to figure out what the story was. And then when I saw another article in the Herald which uh, demeaned the neighborhood, okay? It began to make uh, sense that you devalue the neighborhood and then guess who got to be one of the beneficiaries of that devaluation? The Herald Traveler newspaper, and guess where it was? Right on the block where I grew up. A little side story, I'm in the head of the Herald Traveler's office several years later, 
And I'm asking some questions, and I said, you know, uh, we're neighbors. And he says, oh, you live in Danvers. I said, no. <laughs> you are uh, sitting on the place where I grew up. Right? And so the, to try to get them to understand that part of the, de the way to get urban renewal was to devalue the people, to devalue the area. And so we had to work to over, over, overcome that. And so when you ask the question, in whose interest? Because that, to me, is the first critical piece in terms of what we're uh, trying to do to improve the uh, situation. And it turned out that the redevelopment authority was not operating under the urban renewal laws. And yeah, we had that demonstration, which is now 10 city. But what happened is that when we found out that the law required the urban renewal districts to be um, led by an elected body from that area. And it was Tom Atkins, Joe Timothy, and those folks who were on the city council. Once we went back and saw what the law required, who made the BRA change so that we were able to ultimately make the decisions. And one reason why uh, 10 City exists and some of the other things is because that's the approach. And I need to say that the fact is that we still are operating in a way that the BRA still believes it has absolute power about the decisions that are to be made about what's happening on the land. And every time there's something that comes up, I try to get the folks there to say, we need to have a vote in the neighborhood, one that's an official uh, representative of, of the people. And we can't get that to happen. And unless that happens, some of this talk that we're talking about the future is all, um, I don't know, fool's errands for people, because you don't have a way to say in your neighborhood um, what can work for you and the people there What's the point? Well, thank you. And I'm really glad that it was the Boston Herald that was the um, enemy of th that story. Um, thank you for that. But so, Fred, um, Mel is talking about a, a period of citizen activism in the 60s um, where citizens rose up to stop some of the destructive um, uh, proposals of urban renewal after the New York streets, after the West End. Um, what are the lessons that we can take from, from that experience, and how do they apply to the challenges that are facing Boston today? Well, uh, that's a tall lot. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for including me in this conversation. Um, I, I think in the period we're talking about, uh, that Mel was talking about so eloquently, uh, there was an attitude that's maybe best captured by the, the book a few years ago about uh, the inherent conflict between Jane Jacobs and Robert Moses. And the Moses view was uh, sort of summarized as, if you're going to make an omelet, you've got to break some eggs. Um, basically, I'll paraphrase the Jane Jacobs attitude is, yeah, it goes up my age, you're not breaking. Uh, and as I would say, I didn't, I didn't even get to have a say in it. Uh, and, and the, the notion of destroying things is, is rooted, to me, in a kind of a Calvinist attitude. Uh, a Calvinist attitude. Uh, to do something good, we have to go through a really bad period. You know, if you're gonna, you know, it's like the old Popeye uh, cartoons. Uh, spinach is good for you, but it tastes hard. 
when I was a little kid, I said to my mother, I don't understand the Popeye thing. Uh, you know, the kids don't like the spinach. I love spinach. <laughs> What's going on? And one day I ate spinach at one of the neighbor's houses that was not Italian, and it pissed it off. <laughs> I said, ah, how come, you know, that spinach is good and that spinach is awful. I, now I understand the Popeye cartoon, but what's the trick? He said, well, if you get the spinach, you know, you get some olive oil and you fry some garlic and you make it taste good. It's still good for you uh, if it tastes good. It doesn't have to taste bad to be good. And uh, so from my mother, I got this attitude that, that there's this backward way of thinking that uh, it's got to be, it's got to feel bad to be good for you. In fact, the worse it feels, then you'll know that I'm making you better. It's this mind game that they were playing, that whether it's destroying the West End, destroying the New York streets, uh, ripping through the neighborhoods to build highways, the central lottery, the turnpike, it was, well, this is for the greater good, and too bad you're having the way you got to croak it. Now, the reaction against that, I think Tony's point about the action and the reaction uh, is, uh, is a very important part of what happened. A whole bunch of people, Mel and Ted, Tony were among them, said, this is lousy, this isn't good, it doesn't taste good, and we're going to fight. Uh, and that's an exciting period. Those of us that were part of it are, you know, a lot to remember and feel we were part of something important. But there's another piece of it that I think really has to be emphasized, which is as important as it was for people like Mel and Ted Landsmark and Tony to be making the case that this was not acceptable and it had to change. Uh, if we hadn't been lucky enough to have people like Alan Alshuler and Frank Sargent, I rarely say good things about Republicans, <laughs> but there had to be someone willing to listen to that. It was a two-way process, and Mel and Tony and Ted could have been as eloquent as they are. And if Ed King was running the place, it just been bulldozed over, and that would have been the end of the story, and the city would have been much the less for it. Because destroying things is destroying things. It is not good for you to destroy things. Uh, that's just a mind game they were playing. Uh, but to get out of that trap, Required both the resistance out of the neighborhood, and a lot of people took real risks and, and worked very hard, but it also took people in the government who were willing to step back and say, wait a minute, these people you know, have a right. And, uh, and I, I think that part of the process needs to be remembered that, that the responsive res and responsible government agency is an essential part of this, because at the end of the plan, at the end of the give and take, uh, there used to be too much take and not enough care. But when you get to a more reasonable place, the test of it is still, do you get something done or not? And, and that requires, uh, requires money, which requires taxes. Someone should tell the president. Uh, because you don't get housing built without money. You don't get transit built without money. Uh, and while the interplay was going on, and thank God it went on, with resistance led by people like Mel, to get the government to change, there also were some very far-sighted processes put in place. Like in 1964, the MBTA was organized and funded. And it was funded in order to allow public transportation to grow, not to the same amount of service we, inadequate service we had last week, next week, that's not progress. It was to produce a lot of money to allow the teacher to grow to provide uh, more. So you can't, uh, you can't just will a selfless car right into existence. It requires a process to think about what you want, but then it requires a process to get it done. Uh, I'm talking to one, I'll say one other thing about the the process. Uh, the, uh, uh, there's a story I've heard from a, a Catholic priest that I love. A couple of people have been bored to the story before, but most of them have. We're at one of these prayer breakfasts for, uh, actually it was the bricklayer business agents of 
from Eastern mm -hmm. Massachusetts, and the Royal Brickleys. I had a car. I was Secretary of Transportation. We were working at that, at that time. It was either the Southwest Corridor or maybe it was the Big Dig. And the priest says, well, you know, St. Francis was a Mason. Everybody's really interested. St. Francis was a Mason? Yeah, St. Francis of Assisi, he was a Mason. Well, well, how did that happen? He said, well, St. Francis fell asleep and God came to him in his dream and said, Francis, you have to build a church. So Francis looks up and says, oh, you got the message from the big guy, you got to build a church. So he goes out and he's in the you know, central Italy, the sun is very hot there. He goes out and gathers stones, he works really hard. It's, he works, he works, he gathers stones, does a foundation. And after some months, he builds this beautiful stone church. And he's really happy with himself. He says, I'll probably be happy now. He's exhausted, so he falls asleep. That night, there's a big thunderstorm. Lightning comes and destroys the church. He wakes up, he's inside himself. And then God comes. And St. Francis says, God, what are you doing? You're playing a mind game with me. You told me to build the church, I did all this work, I built the church. I become and destroy it. And God says to Francis, no, 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 you don't understand, Francis. The church that you have to build is in the minds and hearts of the people, not a church of stones. So the, the, the process of the plan is, uh, it's not a physical plan, and you may end up building something quite different from what you started out with. It's what, if, if the process is good, and there are melts and tents to be speaking out, but also out and out shoulders and friends actions to be listening. What comes out of that may be a very different plan, but it's one where people have decided where are we trying to go? Which direction are we trying to go that's going to make all of this effort worth it? Otherwise, it's just, you know, some people like to bowl, some people like to watch movies, other people like to go to planning meetings, but if at the end of it, <laughs> you know, that, that's kind of pointless. It's, it's how do we work together to figure out where we want to go, where we're in, in a manner that will taste good, uh, and, and inspire. And one of the things that Mel and Ed were especially central to was that not only should the product be good, should we build a selfless car that's much more beautiful and functional and has nice parks and well-designed stations. Uh, but also, the process of building that ought to include the participation of the people who live in the neighborhood. And the affirmative action programs that were designed by Alan Alshu in response to Mel and uh, uh, Fletcher Christian and members of mm -hmm. the uh, uh, Chuck, Turner, Chuck Turner was really central for that effort. We end up with a sharing of the jobs for the first time to construction in the street in a manner that I think it's fair to say has proved to be reversal. We walk on a construction job today, uh, you see people of different races, you see women, it's a very different process of building. That's very good, that was very essential, but it's important to remember that what you build is important. So now, we're building a lot of stuff called housing. It's for housing for people who have way more money than they need. It's not helping the people who need the housing. And we're acting as if, well, you got a piece of the job, so go away and be satisfied. In fact, you got to come to the public hearing and support this plan, whether you think it's a good plan or a bad plan, because you got to have those jobs. This happened in East Boston last week, with Mass Board pushing a really stupid parking garage and getting a bunch of construction workers who need jobs coming to show for a stupid plan that's going to create more good luck. So, yeah, it's great that people participate in the construction process and share it, but what we built and what we built does that, does that serve, uh, you know, the aspirations that we develop together in the minds and hearts of the people? That's the test of where we're going. And we're, I think it's a much, we're in, I don't want to be pessimistic, things are much better now than when they were getting bulldozed, and things are much better now when jobs are being shared. 
but they're not much better in terms of what's really getting built at the end of the day. I mean, the, in God's name of it, uh, it's, it's been gentrified you know, to an extreme degree. And if we don't, all of the lower income people really have been effectively pushed out. And if we don't at least provide better transit so that they can reach out we've totally failed. Yet the Fairmont branch is sitting there, we've been talking about it for decades. And today's globe says uh, triple the ridership in the past year. Well, I believe it because people out there need that service. But it's going to take money, serious amounts of money, to make that as good as the arms are. So okay. the, the focus on getting it done and, and why are we doing this needs, needs to be strengthened. Well, that was beautiful. <laughs> and um, I, I'm trying to think about how to like fast forward us to the present. Um, Can I say a few yeah, things? Yeah, go ahead. Just because Chris. I'm sitting here squirming in my seat because I kind of understand my role here, <laughs> which is kind of funny because I'm a first time affordable home buyer program recipient on Harrison Ave. As I, I was. worked on Harrison Ave. I've seen the changes on Harrison Ave. I've drank in Foley's and watched the Herald people like move away from Foley's and everything. And yet I'm here as the kind of champion of what happened in the, and as a direct result of the the plan of 5767 right right um our book heroic really examines this period and, and i kind of want to go out a few canards maybe and sort of cut down or you know tilt at windmills in a way and go against like easy binaries of moses versus jacobs and uh, west end and new york streets and to really encourage a more nuanced understanding of what needed to happen in the city from a Canadian who moved here in 1999 and never thought he would stay and now is, is, is fully embedded in, in the culture of the city. And I think it goes, it goes back to something that Ted was talking about, and it, it is the brand of the city. And the City of Ideas really comes from a Globe insert from 1957, which was illustrated by Muriel Cooper and put out by the Globe and the BRA. Um, which laid out a vision to transform what was then quite literally quoted in the globe, a city in, in danger of becoming something in the backwaters of history, right? And everything that, 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 that we've talked about on this, uh, in, in this panel since would not have happened had there not have been a plan, right? And had there not have been a, a mayor and, and a number of, um, you know, dedicated and People who weren't, weren't evil or against things, there were some evil people, right? Um, I think the, we, we could talk about the, the to, to, to at lengths about things that should have happened in Madison Park that never happened, and it's like my favorite chapter in the book that I'm still trying to grapple with about Madison Park High School and, and the problems that happened there. But I think the, the, the bigger lesson here about the nature of plans and the nature of why plans are, 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 are necessary is because it posits a future, right? And it really says, it sets out um, an agenda that can be reacted against. And if that plan, if the 6575 general plan for the city of Boston did not happen, there would not have been a reaction, there, there could not have been a reaction because the city would have died on the vine. And I, 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 it's, it's very difficult for me to be here like defending that because the, I, I respect to the ends of the earth the people who are on this panel. I was barely born. <laughs> I wasn't born. Um, and, and yet, for, like coming here and really like, like getting fully vested in, in the history of the city and in the, in the cultural history of the city and the political history of the city, um, you know, you, you have to divorce the West End from Government Center. You have to divorce New York streets from some of the other projects that happened during that time. And I think, and I, I wish, I wish um, Lizbeth Cohen was here to talk more about the, the role that Ed Logue played in, in all of this. And I, I really, really, she wrote a, a, a very eloquent chapter in our book, and she's coming out with like a long form sort of, macro history of, of Logue's involvement, uh, both in, in New Haven, New, uh, Boston, and New York. And I think there's the, the, the Jacobs, Moses thing is, is it, it's good as a, as, a, as a 
us versus them metaphor, but it ignores what was happening here and who was doing it here. And so, there. Well, I want to um, go back just briefly to your question about the downsides of growth. Um, one thing we don't like to talk about is that one of the consequences of uh, economic growth in Boston over the last two decades um, uh, is that uh, we have what I think is either the highest or among the highest uh, income disparities uh, in terms of our residents of any city in America. Um, we've attracted a lot of businesses which are providing uh, terrific high-end jobs for uh, people with uh, PhDs or uh, advanced uh, work that they've done in biotech and finance, um, but are, are not necessarily um, uh, the kinds of uh, um, uh, jobs for working class families that are still needed. Um, a consequence is that we've grown in a number of areas uh, in a way that um, grossly overtaxes mm -hmm. um, our transportation infrastructure uh, and makes it uh, virtually impossible to get from one place to another. We um, have uh, invited to the city um, a number of um, uh, corporations and, and encouraged uh, uh, individuals to come who um, uh, represent more diversity but that diversity is often isolated in neighborhoods. Um, at, at the Planning and Development Board, we find that we are constantly uh, faced with um, very uh, difficult ethical challenges. Uh, we could build more units, for example, uh, of private housing um, if, if they were not incorporated into uh, the high-end uh, housing that's being developed. We could do a lot more of that in the neighborhoods, and everyone would agree that having more units is a wonderful thing, but then that also increases uh, economic isolation uh, within the neighborhoods and perpetuates uh, some of the uh, uh, income disparities uh, that exist. So uh, we've got an issue that lots of people are, are debating now. Um, and these are choices that, that have to be made. Are we willing to accept the trade-off uh, of uh, uh, an hour or so more shadow on the Boston Common for $160 million of support for parks and preservation across the city? Um, we would like to say that, that the decisions we make can be made in a vacuum, that they're pure decisions, but they all require uh, difficult and challenging trade-offs. And these are the decisions that we have to make moving forward. It's, it's not about the West End uh, and government center anymore. It's about the nuances and the subtlety of, of planning with a different set of financial resources um, and, and the knowledge that uh, sometimes the decisions you make not only aren't the ones that a particular existing community group would prefer, but may in fact have consequences 10 or 20 years from now that really do have long-term implications, negative implications, um, that we don't see right away. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, Mel's point, which I think is, is ultimately the bottom line point, um, is that we have to figure out who we're planning for and at what moment in time. It's a little bit like being a preservationist and figuring out whether you're preserving a building because of what it was in 1870 or what it became in 1920 or what it became in 1950. And I would submit that when many of us were uh, involved with uh, direct um, activism, we didn't necessarily anticipate the kinds of demographic changes that have taken place in many of our neighborhoods, some of which are the consequence of planning decisions, and some of which are just the consequences of market forces uh, and demographic shifts. Um, so we've got to ask ourselves, and I know that this is the underlying question in the 2030 process, what do we really want to be? And who do we want to be? And who do we think 
we want to be in 2030? Do we want the waterfront, for example, to just be about jobs and economic development, or do we want it to be a place where families feel that they can take their kids so that you know, kids in Boston can have the experience of getting on a boat? We've got to ask those kinds of questions now. Otherwise, inertia and financial marketing forces end up making a lot of the decisions which, you know, 10 or 20 years from now, we won't be proud of. I'd like to ask everybody, actually, what you are hoping the city will look like in, in 2030. Because, um, you know, we have a few minutes before we go to questions from the audience. But, yes, I think that, that planning is all about visioning the kind of city we want to be. Um, you know, there's also a roadmap aspect to planning where you actually put some things down on the on the ground you know and that's the more much more difficult part you know zoning and um you know implementing a, a vision or a plan um i don't even want to go into the shadows i mean i think ted and i disagree about the shadows actually um but uh so talk about how what you'd like the city to be in 2030 um you know we haven't talked about resilience that's a big issue. I know that, that Radu's worked on that. We have, you know, climate change is coming. How, talk about planning for a, a changing future. Um, how can we make this plan that's so beautiful and so uh, visionary into sort of concrete, practical uh, change that will make us into a better city? Actions in the plan in the 2030. You can't do all those. What are the priorities? My priority is equity. That is, I work with people who, there's a lot of the inequality in Boston is due to the erosion of the middle class. There is no problem with middle class in Boston. Uh, those who are manufacturing jobs or the construction jobs. People, construction people don't live in Boston. So as I know, I think that somehow some of those jobs has to even be more active in the neighborhoods. But for me, the, the continuous, somewhat segregation by race, but also by income, is something I would put all my efforts into. Everything else will come along. I think other things will come along because we people who drive them. I think a better transit system somehow more investment. But for me, the question is how does that uh, kid growing up in Roxbury <coughs> or in Chinatown has a chance to become an architect? It has a chance to be a biologist. That's the key. I think I would put all my eggs in that basket because I think everything else will come along. There are plenty of good lobbyists at GD. Plenty of good lobbyists to, 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 to move all those things. And, and then how do you start with that? I would, I would say the goal for me of a, a, a better Boston would be one which is more equal in opportunity. You can't make everybody the same. But opportunity has to be because it's not there yet. And I would think that the problem with the 2030 plan is just got so many things in it that we won't get around to anyway. So I'm going to offer a bit of a counterpoint, only because we are at sort of a, a point where, you know, we are closing this process out and sort of moving on to the next phase of, of the planning. Um, it seems to me that, you know, I, I'm, I get up every morning and I'm delighted about the progress in the city, and at the same time, I'm always impatient to know what next, what new. And if I may, I've, I've thought about it a lot because I've been engaged in this process since its inception in, in many different ways. But um, it seems to me that the old arguments the old challenges are still there from when the first planning was done in the 60s and before. And 
not only are the old challenges there, but the way we are trying to solve them somehow don't seem to be new. In the sense they're new because there's a lot of sort of technological advancements, a lot of resources, a lot of different ways of thinking about planning a city, engagement, and so on. But, but you know, we, we have to remember that we are in this extraordinary sort of geolocation, if you will, where there is this concentration of just pure genius and resources and people and activists and, and everybody who wants to make the city better. So, you know, speaking from a person who deeply sort of is invested in uh, climate change adaptation and, and overall sustainability, um, I think that we are being progressive, but not revolutionary. I feel like we are at a point where we are set to make great change, but I think we are almost afraid to get to those ideas which are going to drastically change the way we think and live. And I think we are at that point where the next step of Imagine Boston, if there's a next phase, we really need to think of our city differently and we need to capitalize. I, I don't know what it is. Um, is it, you know, some kind of high-speed transit system that the world has never seen? Is it like super towers where somehow we make vertical living, uh, you know, very community-oriented? I don't know what it is, but I think we still have to really push for those new models which we are, we don't know what they are, and therefore we kind of, you know, are trying to do many things well, but, but I don't know if we've stepped out of our way, old ways of thinking in certain ways. So. I, I think um, the, the project that you're alluding to without knowing about it is Jan Wampler's um, bicentennial celebration of city, of which this, this campus is uh, the, the only residual result of, which posited a new city for 20 to 60,000 people out in the bay floating, prescient, right? Um, adding new transportation, adding new modes of connection between um, South Boston and, and Dorchester, adding uh, a number of um, cultural and, and uh, artistic facilities that would, would result from such, a, um, such an investment. And it was almost a reality. You know, and, and parochialism, why did it not happen? parochialism and racism, and so that, you know, I mean, it's just that kind of that that kind of um, vision. I think is is something that would be an. Where back uh, they could be Venice, or even better, you know. Or wow. Anyway, Fred. And is this on? I worked on that plan with Jan, uh, and I wouldn't say that it was racism or parochialism uh, that stopped it. There were a lot of exciting ideas in it, but it didn't have a compelling reason to happen. And uh, I, well, I like Jan, and I had a lot of fun working on that with him. I, I would point to Antonio DeMambro, who's in the front row here, that gave us a reason to do that back in the 1980s and no one listened and they're not listening still. The, 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 the climate change challenge uh, is a result of a couple of hundred years. Uh, it's not a recent thing and it's not gonna turn around as quickly as we would all like. And Antonio's position, which I support, was if we love the city, we better build some kind of dam system. Now, if my co-ethnics in Venice could get their act together, uh, why have we not even talked about it uh, in, since the 1980s when Antonio put the idea on the table? And Antonio's vision had a reason for being in that it or something like it is key to the protection of an incredible amount of investment that we're all celebrating here. This nice city is all going to be underwater if we don't take some physical actions to protect it. And that could provide the impetus because in, 
Antonio's basic idea was let's do the infrastructure and then use that to hang the Wampler-esque, you know, new floating city onto it. But, but the, you have to have the cake before you worry about the frosting. And Antonio provided the cake, and no one's been willing to talk about it until just recently people have started again. But they may make mistakes in Venice, but they're doing it. And, you know, my co-nationals are not noted for their effectiveness of getting their act together. So what does it say about us uh, in, in this city, the Athens of America? Some of the elements of the Venice Dan were designed at MIT by Professor Holloman and, 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 uh, and Professor Brass. So it's not for lack of smart people, but we, lots of people want a lot of things, but they want it to be cheap and they don't want to think about anything that requires paying for it. Much of the good things that have happened uh, on the infrastructure side have happened because a long time ago people said, you know, if we want this, we're going to have to pay for it. I mean, the MBTA in 1964 set up a funded mechanism, not a lot of dreams about wouldn't it be nice to travel in a nicer bus or a nicer train, money to build those nicer trains uh, without which they can't happen. Well, one tax cut at a time, the MBTA is a basket case. It doesn't have the money to do it. And if we don't deal with the fact that we need to pay, thing, pay for things if we want them, then we can have nice visions, but they're never going to be implemented because it takes money. And I, I agree totally with Tony about equity being the center of what we ought to be talking about. But I would disagree slightly. I think it's real important a kid from Chinatown or Roxbury or East Boston to become a physicist and what have you. But I think it's essential that the kids who don't become physicists have a shot at a decent life too. Because there's only so many brain surgeon jobs there. And if we just change who gets that small number of jobs, we haven't re all we've done is rearrange the deck chairs. We haven't really made progress unless everyone gets a shot at a better life, including the people who, who don't finish in the highest colleges. Uh, so th that's, that, that to me is a challenge that, that we aren't talking about enough. It, we, we're never going to solve it if we don't talk about it. It's like Antonio's dam. You know, let's start talking about it, maybe we'll figure out how to do it. Let's talk seriously about equity, and maybe we'll figure out what it takes to do. But we need to recognize it is going to cost money. And all of this do more with less nonsense that you hear from these, you know, business experts. That's just, you get less with less. If you want more, you need more. And, and uh, if we want a better city, we're going to have to support means to pay for that better city. And, and a, when I see a better city, I don't mean a more beautiful city, although that's nice. I mean a more equitable city. That's going to cost money. You, you can't live in this city with the housing prices where they're going. And when we get through talking about it, it will still be even more impossible for average people to live in this city unless we build huge amounts of, of, of housing and a lot of transit so that people can live outside of Boston and access these jobs. That's an essential part of dealing with gentrification it's both a lot of housing and a lot of transportation. While we're condemning this city to the future you described of the worst income distribution in the country. I asked the question, in whose interest? Um, and there was a study done by the um, Massachusetts research um, that uh, um, the Drayton heads. Anyhow, what it said was that 35% um, of the folks in the city whose incomes were low would be moved out um, in the next 15, 20 years. You hear that? That's the prediction based on what we're doing right now. Okay? 
Um, so where are we on that? Okay. If we know that what we're doing is pushing people out because their incomes are low, uh, how do we change that? Right? Uh, are we saying that in the 30 years, we just want a city where uh, only the people with uh, money and high education live? Right? And so when you're asking who's interest, you try to figure out, OK, um, the governor, when we were having the issue about the charter schools, made an incredible statement about the 20% who would be left behind. I almost jumped through the TV set. For the governor to say, we're going to own the fact that we are going to support a program where we know that 20% of the children would be in failing schools. I think that's a direct quote, okay? Um, like I said, I almost jumped through the TV uh, to think that the leader of the state would enter into a process where he knew that all the students would not benefit equally so that their life chances would be what we're trying to talk about in terms of who's going to be here uh, 30 years from today. And so we don't begin with understanding that we have a built-in process which denies a bunch of the people and their children the access that would allow them to be part of living in this city in the, in the future. And we know that's happening right now, every day. And so I laughed at first um, when I heard, well, we want to know what Boston's going to be like in 30 days, in 30 years. I said, well, what are we doing about what it's like for the people now who want to be here? OK, now there's a group called the Right to the City. You know, they organize, they're trying to get things moving that allow the people who are here to be able to, to remain. And so uh, one of the things that they uh, push are making sure that the resources for people whose incomes are low to be able to remain are there with housing that meets their needs. Right? Now, we go to the mayor and we say, OK, um, uh, can we get a commitment for um, 35, 35, 35 um, percent of the land that the city owns where housing at that level would be built so that at each point, at least a third of the units would be for people who uh, need to be in, for them, affordable income, right? Now, one of the things that we did at Tent City was, yeah, we got 25 for public housing eligible, 50 for moderate, 25 market, okay? And it works. So if we're going to talk about what's going to be around 30 years, um, are we looking for ways to make sure that the folks whose incomes are low, the folks who are those that the governor says will be in failing schools, can we do something about that? If not, why are we having this conversation? Right? Are you saying that we don't care about those folks. We just want to invite in more GEs and their people in order to, um, for the city. Um, the question of whose city this is, you're saying it doesn't belong to all the people who are here uh, if you're not doing something 
to make sure that they can all remain in this place by doing what's necessary around employment, on education, the things that you know make a difference. Yeah, we had to get the Boston Residence Jobs Program in order to make sure that folks could get jobs in construction. And at one point, when we were talking about it, I said to one of the city councilors, I said, why are you not supporting something like this? Right? Well, his thought was that his constituents were white and that he didn't have to um, um, worry. I said, you go look at the license plates on those white people's cars who are working in the construction and maybe you have a different view. And I says, well, maybe I ought to go into your neighborhood and tell them that you aren't looking out for them, you're looking out for these people from out there. Change this vote, okay? <laughs> uh, no, no, we gotta uh, get real about this topic and what we wanna see happen because it has to begin with in whose interest are we moving forward? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Bill. Um, Ted, do you want to say one last word, or should we go to questions from the... Okay. Um, I'm looking out here to see if there are some questions from the audience. There's a microphone coming around. Thanks. Hi. Um, I have a question for the panel. Uh, as we all know, the Americans with Disabilities Act is... Uh, 27 years old at this point, and it's still not enforceable except if we sue after construction and it opens. I can't look at a blueprint and sue. That the, literally the only mechanism is lawsuit. How do you build into a city plan, a long-term plan, mechanisms that can prevent that heartburn <laughs> <laughs> and long-term litigation that comes from constructing an inaccessible plan to begin with, like an inaccessible infrastructure or property. In specific, too, I mean, Beacon Hill, come on, people. I literally have to fall off the curb to get to my state house. So I've been hugging a light pole and saved by a Fox 25 cameraman before. <laughs> because there's no curb cut on that side where the bus lets off. It's those little things you don't think of until you need them. But how do you build into the plan those little things that will make a long range difference and keep us out of court? Uh, building you know, accessibility into the plan at the, at the front end instead of waiting for Yeah, I mean, your point, is, your point is well taken about what happens once the project is done. Um, uh, and you may have noticed that uh, half of us on this panel are using some sort of mobility assist uh, tonight. And uh, I served for a number of years on the Board of Adaptive Environments. And uh, it was always said there that if we live long enough, we will all be viewed, and in fact, we will all become at some level or another uh, handicapped. I mean, that's just the nature of, of life. Um, I suspect that there are ways of um, uh, making more of the planning, the initial planning products. Uh, you make reference to blueprints but it's a larger process, um, fully accessible. Um, but I, I also think that the, um, the issue is one of, of uh, cultural change. That is to say, uh, there's got to be an understanding, uh, which doesn't always show up, for example, in architecture schools, uh, that the people we're designing for may be uh, shorter, uh, may be um, uh, uh, less mobile, um, uh, may not be able to see. Uh, the first project I got in architecture school was to design a single family home for a blind client. And the moment you do that, you start to rethink 
um, everything you do. I, I sat on a, a jury where one of the women students saw to it that in all of her renderings, uh, she included a pregnant woman. And when asked about that, uh, she said, well, you know, if, you, if you're designing for a pregnant woman, you're pretty much designing uh, for anyone um, who needs to get around or be able to use a space. Um, if the attitude is there, that in fact, we're not necessarily designing for 26-year-old fit individuals who are going to be out skiing in Aspen every summer, but in fact for uh, individuals in the real world, then that earlier access uh, to sites and to plans and to the way we think about planning um, can happen. Uh, you're the first person I've heard raise that issue. I think it's a very salient one. Um, I think it's something we can look at certainly within the agency, particularly around how we make uh, the planning process and the results of that planning process more readily accessible to a wider range of people. And I know folks have worked on that with the way information is posted and uh, the way meetings are held and those kinds of things. But uh, there are improvements we can make in that regard. Sure, you know, if, if demographics is destiny, as they say, um, you know, we are all on a, on a rendezvous with aging. And um, I know that there's a universal design movement that is driven largely by, uh, not by people with disabilities, but by the fact that we're all aging and why not build the, the you know, wider um, uh, doorways and, you know, no thresholds and why not build that in from the get-go um, instead of trying to retrofit homes, which is much more expensive and more difficult. So, you know, what's happening, I see it even writing about articles in, the, in this magazine about architecture. This is a, a movement that's growing, but, you know, it's not going fast enough for uh, many of us. So, um, I'm going to, okay, over here, there's a microphone for this gentleman here. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Derek. Uh, I actually attended the BU Master of City Planning program with Madhu and one of the lessons uh, that boils down into two words from that whole program is policies matter. And uh, in listening to the dis this discussion from the panel, and thank you all so much for <laughs> doing this, um, I think it rings truer and truer looking at the lessons from the past about policies. And one thing I've thought about uh, with the city of Boston and planning policies, uh, particularly with addressing the income disparities and, you know, being a millennial and trying to afford to live in the city. Uh, I wonder uh, what tools uh, would you advise the city of Boston to adopt uh, or change? You know, one thing I think about is Article 80 came about 20 years ago, and we've all talked about how the city's changed every decade. And it's about time that, you know, it, it only took 52 years to revisit uh, doing a master plan. But thinking about Article 80, which has more of an inclusive process for small and large projects, you know, how come that's not something on the table with this plan to reevaluate, should it be, uh, in terms of how to accommodate equitable growth, create units so that it's less restrictive and more accommodating. How do you feel about changing policies to accommodate the changes for 2030? Where the rubber meets the road, right? In, in zoning, in, in um, actual uh, implementation of this plan, uh, what are the tools that we can use to um, make sure that the city doesn't become just like the home for hipsters and empty nesters, you know, the, that it can be um, a city that, that we can all afford to live in. I mean, if I were trying to buy my own home in Brighton, in Oak Square today, I don't think I could afford it. How about that? Well, uh, I'd say a couple of things. Uh, I, I, I don't think it ought to be a priority to build real high-end housing, but some housing for hipsters I think is maybe a good thing. Uh, we've got a lot of people, I, I live in Brighton like you, uh, and 
uh, somewhere around 50% of the, uh, the living units in Alston and Brighton are uh, people who don't have automobiles, yet we insist on building parking, which is real expensive and chews up a lot of land. Uh, and a lot of very decent people say, well, everybody's got a car, meaning I have a car, so everyone should be like me. Well, no, not everyone has a car. And the insistence on a really outdated requirement on parking drives up the cost of that housing uh, and makes it less affordable, and that pushes the demand into the older housing that is no longer affordable. So that's one piece. A second set of hipsters I would build, I would force to be built directly for are the students. I mean, it is absurd. Let me speak about my employer, MIT. They just got the rights to develop Volpe. There's at least 5,000 dwelling units of graduate students at MIT, not housed at MIT. That's a big chunk of the overcrowding on the red line. 5,000 people in the peak hour because the graduate students are forced to live all over the city. They can't afford Cambridge anymore because it's gone through the roof. It's terrible for the graduate students, but it's also an engine of gentrification. If MIT were forced to build affordable housing for its graduate students and its undergraduates, that would relieve some of the pressure in Cambridge. Now multiply MIT, talk about BC, our neighbor, it, there's one game after another to not build, they got the land, they got the money, uh, and they prefer to gentrify the neighborhood because it's cheaper for them. A lot of this comes back to money. Uh, and if we, we could, and, I, and I'm not against universities, I work at one, but they're totally irresponsible when it comes to their own housing policies. So if that piece were dealt with, if the new, we're not gonna build 100% of a neighborhood, we're only making a small increment, so why not have some of that increment be car-free households that could be more affordable? But we also, I think, need to, uh, to recognize that a lot of the rhetoric about housing uh, is uh, an excuse to break the zoning. And if you're gonna change the zoning, it ought to be for specific policies and I'd be with Mel. I mean, if you're gonna, you know, the, the, the fight, unfortunately unsuccessful, that Mel and his neighbors put up uh, at the building that hasn't yet gone into construction in Copley Place, that park, uh, the, let me talk about Copley Place. Some people may know the, the area. Where that strange little sculpture is, some people like it, some people don't. That is legally a park. It was a UDAG grant. Your tax dollars paid money to that developer for that to be cleared a park. Well, I don't see any kids roller skating in the park, but it's, it's open space at least. So the developer says, that was then, now is now. I want to build a high-rise luxury apartment house. And Mel says, if you're going to do that, can't we at least have, I forget what percentage you were looking for, 35% affordable. It should have been 50% affordable. Uh, they're, they're working on land they have no right to build on. The United States government sent them a check to make that a park. If you're going to change that deal, and that should be not automatic, if it's an important park, you shouldn't just be selling it. But if that really is kind of an expendable park, and that was just an excuse to give that developer money, which I think is what it was, and it's okay to think about a high-rise building there, then let's talk about who's in the high-rise building, as Mel attempted to do. And th these, these things happen one project at a time. So broad policy is important, but we've got to have the connection to the actual actions. MIT shouldn't be allowed to do what they're trying to do at Volpe. They ought to be forced to build enough housing for their own students and enough housing that's affordable for neighborhood people to recognize the amount of gentrification they've driven over the past 30 years. It shouldn't be let bygones be bygones. They've done a lot of damage. There ought to be some <coughs> rectification for it. Uh, I, I'll, you know, I won't hold my breath. <laughs> I will shout that that's what they ought to do. Who is responsible there? Where is the um, pressure point there? City of Kent? Is it? Who's 
going to force them? Well, I'm hoping that some of the students at MIT will put some pressure on the institute to demand that the institute pay attention to their housing needs. I've showed up at uh, city council hearings. And by the way, the land in question, MIT bought that land, uh, the, the, not the Volpe land, but the land adjacent to it. They bought it and pledged that it would be used only for academic purposes. That was then, now is now. They went to the city council, and the city council agreed that they could you know, build for Google and Microsoft instead. It, it requires local elected officials to hold the line. A deal's a deal. It, 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 academic housing would be a valid academic purpose, which they promised when they bought that land. They should be forced to deliver. So the city of Cambridge ought to be doing it, and the institute ought to be doing it. They're an important institution. They've got to pay attention to the neighborhood they're in, not just be a global entity. Those were, those were some good tools, you know, change the parking uh, requirements, get the universities to, you know, pay their fair share. Were there other ideas here for tools that can, um, you know, practically change the way we develop in the city? Or should I go to other questions? Um, I would just say that in uh, Boston there is a requirement that universities uh, commit to building housing. If I remember correctly, it's something like 19,000 units, um, which has a major positive impact um, on um, communities where students have been living. Um, in JP, for example, the latest data shows that there was actually a 4% uh, decline in rental rates over the course of the past year in part uh, because more students are being drawn into uh, student housing and, and out of the uh, communities. Um, but it comes in part from regulations within development agencies and in part from a formal commitment on the part of uh, an administration to make that happen. Um, Boston has a, a kind of anomalous um, housing market because of the huge numbers uh, of students who not only come in but can afford very high rentals. I mean, you're looking at uh, uh, $3,500 a month uh, is the latest uh, number uh, I've seen um, that uh, is, is uh, the cost of a new unit, rental unit, uh, in, in the city. And of course, that has devastating impacts um, on the people who uh, live around that. Um, but an administration can, short of rent stabilization, um, have an impact on, uh, on those kinds of trends. Thank you. Um, this is for Professor Tooney. Um, you say that um, planning needs to evolve and, but why does Boston keep building by the water knowing that climate change is inevitable? Why can't they make the plan go to the rural area where the poor are being pushed to and, and try to build the transportation? There's a good question in there about um, the the, the, the city actually has two plans, right? A climate, climate a readiness plan and this 2030 plan, and there are, some people have pointed out that they're a little bit in conflict, so we can talk about that. I guess what you're saying is why resist uh, um, re, uh, retreat to higher ground? Uh, well, I think this whole discussion is actually quite interesting with the policy matters. Well, it turns out implementation matters equally. Yeah, but information? Implementation. implementation. How you make it work is, now, I, th I think probably it's very difficult. The, 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 um, the climate change issue is even more difficult than most planning issues because it's so slow. It may come all of a sudden, but the impact right now is not felt yet. So to be able to invest the kind of money uh, in relocation or a dam or is, is, is 
very difficult for people to make those investments. And that's something planning cannot deal with, as far as I can see. It's like, who, who, who leads the way? Who gets displaced in the rural areas so that all the urban people can move there? But the, the, the implementation problems of, of a good policy are almost insurmountable. It's like it's, um, the, the, the dam is much easier. Well, you know, I, I, I completely agree with you regarding the implementation aspect and sort of going back to the original question of policy and sort of looking at it more um, bird's eye. Um, you know, policy is always playing catch up with reality. I mean, no matter what, you're not going to have the perfect policy at the perfect moment and have the perfect solution. So there are other, and, and one of the things that we need to know and understand is that I think there is a disconnect between sort of the policy that is there and implementation. And I think one of the sort of big factors for that is there's a hegemony of, um, you know, the elite of economic development sort of, you know, takes precedence over everything in the city. And that's true of uh, the waterfront when it was developed. If you put the FEMA maps down, uh, frankly, you know, we are <laughs> in, in a pretty bad state. And yet, right before my eyes, for three years in a row, I went with my students to the innovation district and provided, you know, alternate plans. And we knew that that was happening. And yet, you know, three years later, we go back and the buildings have come up with all the mechanical not where it's supposed to be. So, so I, I think, you know, there's policy, there's plan, there's, uh, you know, developers, but I, I don't think we should underestimate the power of champions in the system. And particularly uh, when there are new things to be done and not everybody's on board. And I think we have a lot of champions here for different causes. And I think that, it, you know, planning, planning needs agency. <laughs> And the agency are, is, are the people of the city and, and the people whom we elect or the planners. And I think we need to take some responsibility. And if we really want to make a difference, we need to create champions in the system and, and participate. It's kind of at odds with the, so the, 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 the innovation district, right? I mean, we're hearing, let's not do top-heavy planning, and yet the environmental stuff is requiring some pretty top-heavy decisions to be made, right? And so it's like, and if, and... You're, you're saying that Mother Nature is forcing these decisions? Is no, I'm just mean? saying if, if, if you wanted to, if, if you want to mitigate um, environmental catastrophe, it's going to have to be a very top-heavy and, and very expensive solution and that solution is not going to come from private development that solution is going to have to come from the government right and as a dyed in wool canadian socialist i'm entirely in favor of higher taxation and more payments from universities and more payments from developers to and those payments to go to the city coffers to pay for the public good Right, but there there is this real thank you. There's this there's this real kind of tension between we don't want top heavy planning and or top heavy decision making going on at the same time that we need that top heavy decision making and that top heavy investment to literally save the city from drowning, right? And so what do you get? You get the seaport and you get three architecture firms doing 75 of the buildings at fees which are horrific to the people that are working for those firms and they're perpetuating uh, like, you know, it's like you, you can just, it's, you follow the money and the money is not going anywhere near where it needs to be going. So in the, you're saying in the absence of a strong top-down sort of government response, the private market just runs roughshod over, the, over all of us. Yeah. <laughs> I, I probably shouldn't say this, but I will. Um, I, I have a cynical colleague who says that uh, the reason that we ought to encourage uh, the kind of uh, residential and commercial development that we've seen on the waterfront is that it does generate 
um, taxes, revenues, and contributions to uh, both uh, a job training and affordable housing uh, trusts um, in a way that benefits the rest of the city. And if the people who then find that their front doorsteps are underwater uh, five years from now um, are, are a group of uh, wealthy foreign investors or people who came in from uh, suburbs, well, that's okay. Better them, <laughs> right, better, better them than uh, working people who might want to live there you know, 10 or 15 or 20 years from now. Um, I, I would just add one other thing to what uh, Tunney has said, and, and that is, it's true that in Boston, by and large, um, the, we don't feel yet that much of the impact of climate change and sea level rise, but in cities like uh, 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 Newport News and Norfolk and uh, Miami, and uh, Charleston um, flooding um, on a regular basis has now increased from four or five days a year to 12 to 15 days a year in their downtowns. And it's having major impacts on uh, residential and tourism and, and uh, commercial impacts. And th all we need is the one wrong storm here. Um, and uh, a big chunk of Logan Airport will be underwater. And it's at that moment that we uh, may then start to think about some of the local impacts. Um, but there's always resistance um, uh, to uh, implementing those kinds of top-down rules that uh, might in fact have a positive long-term impact on how we manage water um, and how we protect our waterfront. Well, I'm getting a high sign, so I think I, I, we have time for one more question. Um, so, Antonio. Oh, are there? Oh, hi. Okay, maybe if we can make it short, then maybe we can get a second one up there. Okay? So, ahead, there's ahead. been a discussion about implementation. Um, and as I look at Boston 2030, this is, Boston is part of a greater area, um, and I've heard people talk about MIT, students at MIT, or transportation that, that goes through many different cities. Um, how can a plan like Boston 2030 be successful, or what needs to be done if Boston is creating a plan, but that might not match up with what Brookline does, or Newton does, or Cambridge does, or Somerville does? How can, how can this plan be successful, and how can Boston, what should Boston be doing to, to to connect to that, that greater implementation that needs to, would need to occur across, the across our group community. This is a question about regionalization, which every, always makes everybody sleepy, but it's so important um, for cooperation across municipal boundaries. I mean, there is work that the city's doing to tie together um, at, at a variety of levels, transportation and housing and, and other uh, aspects of planning. Um, and when you do a, a, a a project, a process of this scope um, with the kind of engagement and technical work uh, uh, that's been done by many people, uh, many of the smaller surrounding communities start to buy into that because uh, they view it as legitimate and credible. Um, and so part of the deal always is to engage those folks through MAPC and other kinds of, of planning entities. Uh, I know the mayor has met with um, mayors of adjacent cities to try to uh, uh, coordinate planning across the cities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to thank all the panelists for uh, uh, reminding us of what my teacher, Kevin Lynch, would ask every day. What is a good city? because that's what we should really focus. And he outlined some attributes that you have all repeated verbatim. Equity, accessible opportunities, justice, beautiful, connected. I think that we will move forward in a very positive way if we accept this as the criteria, as the 
given the attributes that each idea about the future of our city should comply with. Regarding the future, I have a big problem with Imagine Boston 2030. I think short-sighted, <laughs> very, very short-sighted, because this kind of debates, this kind of undertaking, should really look at a minimum of 50, but possibly 100 years ahead, and then go back to 2030 as the beginning of the implementation. But you will not get the future if you start with that. It's a frozen plan. It's not a plan. It should not be a plan. It should be directions for the futures. And if we look at direction, we open the opportunities. And we can ask very important questions. One of the questions that we need to ask, how many people are we going to be in this region in 50 years? Are we going to be, we are now 4 million. Are we going to be 5 million, 4.5, 4.2? It's a big difference. It defines the level of infrastructure changes, the level of housing that you need to build, the level of schools, etc., etc. We don't ask this question and we focus on other things. And I beg you to really begin to focus about the city in that way. Let me then get back to my pet project, which is transformative infrastructure investments. That has to be the backbone of our discussion. Yes, all of the things that you have brought to us are important, they should be the attributes. But what are we going to do? What are the infrastructure that we need to have to make a better city, a more manageable, a more equitable city? In, ad in addition to the issue of uh, the sea level rise, there are thousand other infrastructure investments that we need to make, and don't tell me we don't have money. That is not the way this city has dealt with its future for 200 years. We cannot abandon the path that the founders of this city have set. They were not scared to do what they have done in 1900. Can you imagine? They decided to fill the harbor good or bad ideas, history will say, but they, they managed, they didn't have the money, so let's not be back down on the money, let's remember the attributes we have learned in 250 years, a lot about what a good city, our good city should be, let's make sure that those attributes are enriched, but let's think creatively about the infrastructure that we need to set in place and remember the infrastructure that we will need for the city of the future are going to be 30 to 40 years to plan, to discuss, to fight, to finance, to implement 40 years, 50 years. That is how we need to discuss about our city. Yeah, but, well, thanks very much. I, I honestly don't know how I can top that, or, or any of us could. A, a mic drop. <laughs> so I, I really want to thank everybody for coming, for your thoughts, for your concern, for your commitment to the city, um, and everybody on the panel here tonight. Let's keep it going. <laughs>